All right. All right. Well, good good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on next generation LD films. Uh, look for, look forward to hosting you for this uh, one hour webinar session. Uh, Matt, if you could go ahead and turn on your uh, video. There we go. And audio. Good morning, Matt. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Mike. How about yourself? All right. Yeah, we're doing great. We're looking forward to um, uh, hosting this webinar. It's so great to have you as a speaker. It's so great to be partnering with Forge Nano on this on this great topic. Um, and um, again, to our audience, welcome. I know that a lot of people are coming in as the um, as we get started here. What I'll do is I'll uh, I'll start with uh, just a very brief introduction for our speaker today, uh, uh, and then uh, to introduce the topic a little bit, and then we'll get going with uh, the webinar session. We'll be going for about forty minutes or so, maybe forty five, and and then uh, so we'll have uh, we'll have Matt speak, and then we'll have some time for Q and A. Should be about 15, 20 minutes for questions uh, after uh, Matt's presentation. So, a brief introduction for our speaker. Our speaker is Dr. Matt Weimer. Uh, he is uh, principal uh, R and D scientist at Forge Nano, and he specializes in semiconductor applications for atomic layer deposition. The topic for uh, today's talk. Um, uh, he has a background in synthetic chemistry, experience in novel ALD tool development, and device characterization. He also has hands-on experience with the full cycle uh, of, uh, of ALD. Uh, Matt has a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Washington and also a PhD from the Illinois Institute of Technology with a joint graduate appointment at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, so after the postdoc at, at a &L, uh, Matt joined the R&D deposition group at LAM Research, where he provided ALD and chemical va vapor deposition CVD solutions for new product development on a variety of tool sets, uh, thermal and plasma based, in logic and in memory applications. Um, at Forge Nano, Matt identifies and develops novel ALD solutions over a range of applications in, semiconductors, in the semiconductor space. Uh, Matt has multiple papers, patents, and talks in the fields of synthetic chemistry, ALD, and CVD. Uh, and also in his spare time, he's an avid racquetball player, hiker, traveler, and also home brewer. Uh, Matt, uh, so again, so great to have you as a speaker today. It's an excellent topic. Our topic for today is uh, next generation ALD uh, films, process challenges and solutions to accelerate the, uh, the MEMS development cycle. Uh, we have... Um, uh, we have a great audience today, uh, worldwide. Uh, we uh, over uh, over two hundred people uh, have registered for this uh, for this event for this webinar from all over the world, uh, North America, Europe, Asia. Um, uh, we have people from Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa. So really all over the world. Uh, it's so great to see so much interest in this topic. And again, uh, uh, it's so great to have Matt as our speaker. So Matt, everything is all set and ready to go. Um, again, we appreciate you giving this talk and uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate that uh, generous introduction. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. I know it's probably very late or very early for some of you, so we really appreciate it. Uh, as Mike said, I'm Matt Weimer, uh, Principal R&D Scientist at Forge Nano. Today I'm going to talk about next generation AOD films and sort of how to uh, accelerate the R&D to production cycle. Uh, and so for those of you who aren't familiar with Forge Nano, uh, we're an ALD tool provider out of Northern Colorado in the US, uh, just north of Denver. There's a, a beautiful picture of the, the front range there. Uh, it's quite a beautiful place to visit. If anybody hasn't been, I highly recommend it. Uh, most people are familiar with Forge because we offer the world's largest powder or particle ALD uh, offerings. So we're the, the only people in the world that have production scale powder ALD uh, capabilities. Uh, you know, we have those tools out, out in the wild uh, across the world. Uh, we have installation base across Europe and Asia, as well as North America. But that's not what I'll be talking about today. Today, I'll be talking about our wafer and object coders, for which we believe uh, we have the fastest single wafer tool in the market. Okay, so, you know, before I sort of talk about a little more of, of ALD and, and Forge Nano, uh, I, I kind of want to give us a little intro as to sort of why we're, we're here. So from my perspective, and of course I'm biased, ALD is a very elegant vapor deposition technique, right? You start with some material, you have a very thin uh, coating. So, you know, usually we're talking on the, the nanoscale here. There's a, a great image of a particle coated with ALD. And what you're hoping to do is with this small thin film, 
you want to improve the production of whatever device you're actually making, whether it's you know uh, wafer level, batteries, magnetics, fuel cells. Uh, there's many other applications where ALD has been has been used successfully, both in the R and D lab and in production. And there's a few reasons for this, which I'll sort of uh, highlight here, but then sort of dig into deeper. The first is that AOD really provides a very strong uh, chemical bond to the surface. Uh, sort of by definition, how AOD works, your, your film will be quite well adhered. So that, that really helps to play with stability uh, for AOD coatings. You can really modify the, the performance of materials with a very small, uh, very thin film. Uh, and we'll talk about scales a little bit later. Uh, as I've shown in this, this image here, uh, AOD provides a uniform and pinhole free coating. So essentially that means, you know, at a very thin total thickness, usually on the scale of nanometers, uh, you get a continuous film. So this is very important when you talk about dielectric barriers uh, or moisture barriers or, or a few other applications. And I think uh, one of the misconceptions that I, I hope we can clear up today is that, you know, with ALD, you can actually drive down the cost of, of your device. Um, so, you know, that, that's something that I think will be uh, sort of interesting to talk about as we go through. Uh, and so, again, for those of you who, who don't have a lot of experience with ALD, I do like to point out the, the places where it's actually used in production. And so it's sort of first uh, application in production was with electroluminescent displays. Uh, that was sort of where it got its, its big start. Um, it, it was also used, it is used as a gate dielectric um, for 300 millimeter logic devices. Uh, so Intel sort of gave ALD its first moment in the sun with that. Uh, ALD was really an enabling technology for 3D NAND, which, you know, has changed the way that, that we do uh, computation. Um, we've also, with ALD, been able to bring other things to the market, like OLED devices. Uh, the ability to provide a, a moisture barrier there was, was quite critical. It is used in MEMS currently in a lot of places, and, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And finally, uh, as a passivation layer for PERC solar cells, uh, this is probably the, the largest volume, I would say. Uh, there are current tools that can run, you know, 10 to 30,000 of these modules in roughly an hour um, in these giant batch reactors. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about batch reactors as we go through. Okay, so just to, to talk about Forge Nano and sort of my role in it, um, our goal is to sell equipment. So here's an example of, of sort of an intermediate size uh, particle AL decoder. Uh, you know, we want to sell these to people. And then, of course, once they're in the field, we need to maintain and, and provide spares. So, you know, really, we want to live in those two bookends as, as a company. Uh, there are some customers that, that prefer us to manage their precursor. It's not a, a primary goal, just like toll coding. Um, you know, occasionally when we're developing a tool for somebody, uh, you know, we'll have some toll coding agreement to help them get to where they need to go. So the last bucket here where I live is in product and process development. I'm in the R&D group. Uh, I run a, a small R&D lab in our facility where we, we have our, our wafer tools and we're constantly um, developing new ALD solutions uh, for what we think are, are problems out there. So, you know, I, I go out and I, I listen to, to people who, who make devices, uh, hear what challenges they have, you know, come up with some crazy ideas and, and go back into the lab and, and try and find solutions for them. So it, it's a great job. I get to play around with a lot of uh, new films and, and new devices uh, and, and see if I can come up with something, something that works. So my job is essentially trying to do R&D and, and move it to production scale. Okay. And so, you know, why does this matter for, for you all? You know, mo most people here, I think, um, care about MEMS or, or work on MEMS or, or have some passing interest in them. Uh, so AOD is currently used in, in a lot uh, of MEMS and sensor devices. And it's used in two primary ways. Uh, the first is what's called functional material. So this means you have a, a thin film that's uh, providing the, you know, the actual primary function or maybe some ancillary function for the device. Uh, you know, a great example is depositing piezoelectric material uh, like HCO to, to actually do some, some, uh, some actual uh, movement of a device. So, so here's an example of an HCO film deposited by ALD um, that actually has a successful piezoelectric behavior. This is a very interesting topic, uh, and there's a lot of really good work that's, that's coming out. Uh, however, I, I would say from my perspective, it's a little, little bit far in the future uh, for where I think ALD needs to be when it comes to MEMS. But if anybody's interested, 
Uh, Sternad and co-workers uh, just came out with a wonderful review on the topic. Uh, so I highly recommend you all check it out uh, if you have an interest in it. Okay, so if we move over to the, uh, to the right here, uh, the other sort of bucket is what are called uh, passive materials. So here the AOD film uh, provides some sort of protection, but it doesn't provide any actual um, you know, function for, for the, the mem or the, the device. And so those are really three primary uh, components, a physical character protection, chemical protection, or electrical protection. And so here's, a, I've listed a few of the uh, examples of, of where AOD has been shown to be successful, primarily in the literature or what we've heard from collaborators in, in the market. Um, there's a couple of things that I have highlighted here. Uh, dielectric barriers are, are quite critical. Uh, ALD is, is a very successful vapor deposition te technique for di uh, dielectrics. Um, so that, that's quite, quite critical. And then moisture barriers. Uh, you know, I think most, for most people, uh, using an ALD ceramic as a moisture barrier uh, is a great sort of gateway to start using ALD into their device flow. Um, it's sort of a, an easy way to, to accept it. And so that for me, from my perspective, there's a very good reason why ALD and MEMS uh, work together so well. Uh, so on the right here, I'm showing an example of a, of a ball bearing for a gear uh, that has been coated with ALD. And now if you look at the sort of um, the, the cross section of the gear, uh, you notice that the wear surfaces are undercut, right? So especially when you look at the, uh, the inside here, coating this is very challenging for most vapor deposition techniques because it's a non-line-of-sight non feature and it has such a large undercut. But for ALD, uh, because anywhere the gas can go, ALD can coat and it will coat uniformly, um, ALD is, is great for these sort of challenging architectures. Uh, and as, as one of the themes for today, you know, it's, I think it's most common for people to adopt ALD sort of when they have to. Uh, and usually when they have to, it's because they have some feature or some aspect ratio that's challenging or impossible to go with any other technique. And so, you know, the, the other sort of big point I wanna leave with today is, uh, you know, I, I believe that ALD is really underutilized in, in current MEMS manufacturing. And hopefully I can convince you all of that. Okay, as a quick agenda, um, you know, I'll go over four primary topics. Um, I don't wanna take for granted that everybody knows how ALD works. Um, and so, you know, I do wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the basics of ALD and sort of what that means for films and, and for MEMS specifically. Uh, and also the challenges therein. Uh, and then I'll, I'll transition a little bit to the forged nano differentiation um, and then talk about advanced applications using ALD for MEMS. All right, so let's get started. So everybody who is familiar with ALD has seen this picture, you know, schematic about a billion times. Uh, but for those of you that haven't, let, it's a very useful tool to sort of get introduced to ALD. Because ALD is about sequential surface reactions, putting down one layer at a time, Let's ignore chemistry for a second and just think about this in sort of Lego blocks. So here we have a surface that has this blue Lego block surface. We introduce our metal precursor. That's this green Lego block with the uh, little points here. Um, so these points are complementary to these divots. So they match up perfectly. And once you fill in all those divots, once you get one layer of Lego blocks, no further reaction can occur. This is the self-limiting or self-terminating nature, terminating nature of ALD, and it's critical to how it works. Once you get that, that full layer down, no other reaction happens, and you must purge out the, uh, the remaining precursor and whatever reaction byproducts are there. Okay, so you now, you now have a different surface than where you started. You need a complementary precursor to sort of convert back to where you started so you can continue on. So now we put in these blue Lego blocks. Uh, they match up perfectly with the green ones. The same fundamental process happens where you get one layer down and then, and then stop. You then purge away your film. Now you've completed one ALD cycle. You have a digital amount of film. That means in a perfect world, uh, for every ALD cycle, you get the same amount of film. So now you can uh, grow your film as thick as you would like by repeating this ALD cycle as many times as your heart desires. So again, uh, this is a great schematic to, to think about ALD but it ignores surface chemistry. Uh, as, as Mike mentioned, I am a, I'm a chemist, so that's where my, my brain lives. But before we, we talk about the nitty gritty surface chemistry, I wanna give people an analogy uh, that, that might not be familiar with, uh, with chemistry or comfortable with the, the Lego blocks. And I like food, I love cake. So I like to think about ALD like making a layer cake. 
So on the right side here, we have this beautiful chocolate layer cake, and it has two components. It has cake, and it has icing. This is just like ALD, right? So how do you make this cake? Well, you start with your cake. You put a layer of icing on top. Cake again, icing, and you build that up to uh, however you tall you want your delicious cake to be. And then you're done. You coat the whole thing in icing, and, uh, and you enjoy it. So, you know, I know this is a bit of a tortured analogy, but if you think about the cake, if your cake piece gets, you know, really, really tall, the structural integrity is, uh, fails and your cake falls over. If you use too much icing, the, the two pieces of cake slide off. So, you know, it's kind of self-limiting, but also kind of not, you know. So, you know, again, this is, a, hopefully it's a great maybe a hook for people who are new to the field can, can think about how ALD works. Um, you know, again, I think it's quite fun. And if, if you all uh, remember nothing else, please just remember that ALD and layer cakes are, are quite similar. Okay, so let's step back into the, uh, the dangerous and lovely world of, of chemistry. So here, this is the same schematic, except we've replaced the Lego blocks and put in actual chemicals, okay? And here I wanna show three main things, that it's based on spontaneous reactions, which means the, the reaction will occur at the given temperature. It's sequential, we have to do it in order, and that self-limiting behavior. I, I, want, um, to under, I want you all to understand from a chemical perspective what self-limiting means. Okay, so now our green Lego block is trimethyl aluminum or TMA. Aluminum is green in the middle and it's surrounded by CH3 uh, or methyl groups. When this sees the surface of hydroxyl groups or OH, you move a, a proton, an H, uh, from the surface to the CH3 and you make methane. Great, that goes away. More importantly, you make a surface oxygen aluminum bond. And as I've already mentioned, this is where that great surface adhesion comes from. By definition, ALD is making and breaking surface bonds. So now you have a very strong, very well adhered uh, film to your surface. Again, once you've, con you've consumed all of those uh, reaction sites, your surface now looks a lot like the gas phase TMA. So because TMA doesn't react with itself, I mean, if it did, we wouldn't be able to use it. This TMA won't react with that surface that's been completely covered. That's where the self-limiting behavior comes in. The other problem I have with the uh, Lego block analogy is it ignores the reaction byproduct. This can be quite critical when it comes to ALD. Uh, for this process, methane is pretty benign, so it's not super critical, but it's important for us to remember that, that there is something else coming out here. Okay, so we've done half a cycle. Let's purge it out. Let's move in our new uh, complementary precursor. In this case, it's just water. The same reaction happens. You move a proton from the water to the methyl group, generate methane. Again, new surface oxygen aluminum bond, uh, and you've now completed one cycle of ALD and your surface looks like what it did when it started. So there's some very cool things that come out of this very simple schematic for ALD. I've sort of listed them here at the bottom, uh, but I actually prefer to talk about them in pictures um, because it's, it's a little bit more intuitive for me. So the first thing that comes out of the self-limiting nature is what we call conformality or conformal coatings. So I've already said it a couple of times, but anywhere that the ALD process gas can go, you will get a uniform coating of ALD film if you wait long enough. It's a, a bit of a caveat there, but it's quite important. And so here I'm showing a 100 to one aspect ratio feature. It's coated with the same amount of ALD film at the top as it is at the bottom. Again, this is where people usually come to ALD for this behavior. Uh, if we move to the right here, this next box is tailored multilayers. Uh, this is also referred to as nanolaminates. Uh, and here, you know, this really comes out of that digital nature of ALD, where you can control very, very fine how much film you're putting down. And you can put two different materials, two different oxides, or maybe an oxide and a nitride, and sort of layer that up to tune the bulk properties of the overall film. Uh, this is very useful, and I'll talk about it at length more. Um, so for now, we'll just leave it at that. The next is precision, precision thickness control, which also falls into the, the category of uh, uniform film coating or pinhole free coating. Um, you know, again, Forge does a lot of uh, powder ALD. So we get a bunch of cool images. Here's one of a roughly 50 nanometer particle that has about five nanometers of ALD coating. Uh, if you notice, the ALD coating has the same thickness all the way around the particle. There's no cracks, there's no pinholes. Uh, this gives a very well adhered, uh, very, you know, um, dense coating. Okay, so then this last one here on the top, high surface area. Um, I promise this is not a, a picture of Northern Italy, 
This is actually a picture of platinum nanoparticles deposited by ALD on high surface area silica. So I'm using this example to hopefully dispel a few myths of how ALD works. The first being that you always get a film. So when it comes to a metal, especially something like platinum on a very challenging surface like silica, the platinum will want to grow in islands and eventually it will coalesce into a film, but at the very beginning, you get very small isolated nanoparticles or nano islands. Uh, anybody who has the ha ha who has had the unfortunate pleasure of putting platinum on high si on, on silica can attest to just how difficult it is to, to get it to adhere. It really doesn't like to, to stick there with a lot of other deposition techniques. But because ALD is making and breaking those surface bonds, these platinum nanoparticles are very well adhered to the silica. All right. So finally, down below, um, you know. ALD is considered a low temperature deposition technique. Most processes live below four or 500 C. Um, but you know, in, in our case, low temperature doesn't mean low quality. There's a, a lot of um, correlation of temperature and, and film quality with a lot of other techniques. And there is with ALD, uh, but the low temperature doesn't mean you get a low quality film. So here's an example where we're depositing uh, crystalline titanium nanowires in a process by uh, what's called subtractive manufacturing. And, and just very briefly, uh, subtractive manufacturing means you start with some template. Uh, in this case, we're showing a, a nodic aluminum oxide. You then fill it with the ALD coating. And again, because it's conformal, uh, this coating doesn't have a void. And then you remove your template, you, uh, you etch it away, and you're left with freestanding uh, nanowires uh, that are crystalline, and they're used for a whole litany of, of wonderful things. So again, this is sort of a, a unique example that, that isn't really used in production, but I think it, it shows the uh, variability of, of ALD. Okay, so I've just spent the last 15, 20 minutes telling you about how wonderful ALD is. Um, and I'm sure most of you are kind of thinking, well, you know, if it's so great, why isn't it everywhere? Uh, and that comes down to, in my mind, two major problems. The first, ALD is considered slow. And I think that's the most common answer you'll get when you, you talk to people about it. So here's a, a graph of deposition rate in nanometer per minute uh, versus step coverage. ALD lives in that upper left-hand corner because it has perfect step coverage, but deposition rates are usually at best a nanometer a minute. From our experience uh, and from what people have told us, you know, if you can get to about 10 nanometers per minute, you can start to displace a lot of existing uh, films uh, with ALD. Uh, one other just brief aside uh, that sort of speaks to the speed of ALD, uh, in the field, we talk about deposition rates in growth per cycle, and usually it's angstroms, uh, but we don't tell you how long a cycle takes. So that's, you know, I think an indicator of just how slow ALD actually is. Okay, so now the second problem is that ALD is expensive. Most precursors are designer chemicals. They're, there's a few that are, are a little bit cheaper, but they're certainly not, not feedstock chemicals. So they, they start out as, as expensive. Uh, and here's that, that platinum example that I showed earlier with the nanoparticles on, on silica. So the precursor itself is extremely expensive, but it's even worse than that. Most processes tend to, to utilize anywhere between 10 and 20%, maybe up to 50% for some amazing processes. Um, so, you know, you're literally flushing precursor down the pump. Not, not a great business model. I, I will say that, you know, this is a little bit different in the powder world. Uh, one of the things that we do better than um, you know, maybe everybody else is, especially with powder ALD, we're, we're able to utilize our chemicals up to, you know, 80, 90 percent. Okay, so it's very important from my perspective to, to overcome these barriers for ALD to be more widely adopted. And to do that, I really want to talk about why we're stuck in this trade-off. And so let's just talk about some perspective here on what a reactor looks like. Uh, on the left, I have what, what is considered to be a traditional ALD reactor or a cross-flow reactor. And very simply, it's, it's just a very uh, large volume with a gas input on one side and, a, and, an, and an exhaust, uh, an output on the other side. And in this design, you're required to, to choose one of two pressure regimes, either high pressure or low pressure. In the high pressure regime, you tend to use your precursors quite efficiently for ALD. Um, your gas molecules spend more time in the reactor, but when you wanna purge, when you wanna remove those chemicals, because the, the, the molecules spend more time in the reactor, it takes longer to purge. So, you know, you say, all right, I want to move faster. I need higher throughput. Let's go to lower pressure. That will 
move my, my molecules through the reactor faster. And it works. Purge times decrease. But the problem is now you find you have to put more precursor in the chamber to get to that same uniformity. And there's even times when you can't get to that same uniformity if you go too low in pressure. So you're stuck in this trade-off between more efficient precursor use or shorter purge times. And you know this is not a, a new concept for the field. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that, that people have tried to, to sort of deal with it. And from my perspective, the, there's really two cheats that, that, that exist in, in the market. The first is uh, what's referred to as spatial ALD. So traditional ALD, you can also call it temporal ALD because the precursors are separated in time. So here we keep them, we, we put them in at the same time, but we separate them in space. So you have precursor A, precursor B, and you either move the uh, deposition head or you move the substrate. Uh, this can get you very fast speeds. Uh, Benic has a wonderful tool on, tool on the market, I think uh, designed for optics, and they can get up to about 15 nanometers per minute. It's, it's quite impressive. Um, there is some limitations to where sp spatial ALD can be applied. Uh, and, and I know there's a lot of hesitation, um, especially when it comes to particles and, and just having moving parts in the chamber. The other cheat that, that exists, and I think is uh, certainly much more common in the 200 millimeter space, are batch chambers. So here's a picture of a 25 wafer batch chamber. Um, and I want to point out a couple of things here. Instead of having a single wafer design um, that I was showing in the, the cross flow too earlier, you now have to worry about diffusion uh, between wafers. You have a much larger convection oven um, and you have to worry about heating uniformity and a bunch of other engineering problems that, that have been dealt with. And, and there's some wonderful batch chambers on the market. Uh, you know, and I, I gave an example earlier for the Perk solar cells. These are just giant batch chambers uh, that, that only do TMA water. Now, the speed of, of a single AOD cycle actually struggles quite a bit. You get a much longer cycle because purging and introducing precursors is a bigger challenge. Uh, from my understanding, precursor consumption is also worse, but you can get very good thickness uniformity. So these have been propagated, uh, you know, not because they're slower, but because the overall trade-off between speed and throughput actually improves. Another way to say that is, you know, the, you put 25 wafers in, but it doesn't take 25 times as long. Um, so, you know, again, neither of these really address that trade-off directly. They're just kind of workarounds. So before I talk about the, the ALD, uh, ALDX difference, I want to point out one more um, detriment for, for batch tools. And that comes down to the R&D development cycle. If you're developing an ALD film, you're doing it on a single wafer tool. You're not doing it on a batch tool. So once that, that, that film has been developed and you find it successful, you now have to transfer it to a tool that can take 10 times longer to, to do the same deposition. So one of the things we've seen is that it's not just the overall thermal budget that matters. It's also the overall time at temperature that matters. And this is specifically uh, most critical when you're dealing with piezoelectric material. We've heard that, that some PZT material can degrade by 60% when it's uh, you know, gone from an R&D tool to a batch tool. So from, from our perspective, uh, you know, MEMS uh, production can really benefit from um, you know, single wafer tools. Okay, so that's the ALD basics. I know I spent a little more time on that than I would have liked, but I, again, I think there's some critical stuff. I do wanna pause here and see if there's any questions, uh, if anybody has any, burning uh any burning desires here yeah that's great uh matt we actually do have so first yeah, great presentation uh, doing great and yeah we do actually have some questions that already came in so let's take a couple of questions uh so both questions actually from uh, daniel clark uh, he's saying we make microstructured glass at sub-zero and room temperature to enable next generation solar so the question is can the first question is can you can ald code micro 3d surfaces absolutely yeah i mean you know that the diameter of an opening for, for let's say, a, a, a hole can be down to the nanometer size. Um, you know, that I've, I've coded features that were 20 nanometers in diameter. Microns are no problem either. Um, you know, the, the one thing I would I just want to clarify here is um, I assume that the ALD can be done at other temperatures. Does it need to be sub-zero? Um, I would say there are a few ALD processes that work at room temperature. Um, TMA water, uh, DEZ water, those, those are both successful there, certainly. All right, very good. And then another question from Daniel, is there a max height? Is there a max height of the uh, micro 3D structures for ALD coding? Yeah, so a better way to talk about that isn't height, it's, it's aspect ratio, which is the opening at the top versus the height. 
Um, and so, you know, I've, I've deposited features that were a thousand to one uh, opening to height. Uh, and really the, you know, the honest answer is if you're patient enough, you can coat anything that you want with ALD. So long as your ALD process uh, doesn't have any chemical vapor deposition uh, reaction. So, you know, for a, an ideal ALD process, there is no limit. It, functionally speaking in reality, it, it really depends on the process. Um, but for like TMA water, no, I mean, I've coded, you know, 10,000 to one uh, aspect ratio features, so. Okay, let's see, we have more questions coming in. By the way, a reminder, um, or, or just to let everybody know, please put in your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box, we had a question. Uh, one person put into the chat box, so please put it into the Q and A. Um, but yeah, lots of questions coming in. Uh, this next one's from Anchor. Uh, does the uh, quality in terms of both conformality and density remain the same when temperatures and or pressures are changed? Uh, that's a wonderful question. I could I could talk for a whole hour just on that topic, Anchor. Uh, the the uh, the answer is no. The the well. So that, let me let me break this apart. Conformality. If your ALD process is actually ALD conformality will be the same regardless of temperature and pressure, okay? So you will get conformal coating if you're at high temperature or low temperature, as long as it's still ALD. If you go too hot, you're doing CVD, con conformality breaks down. Go too low, you're doing uh, condensation, which is also not ALD, conformality breaks down. As long as you're in what's called the ALD temperature window, you're good. Uh, density will usually improve as you increase in temperature, again, in that ALD window. So as a, a rough rule of thumb, as the temperature increases, the density will, will follow. There is some, pro some processes that sort of uh, plateau. TMA water is one of them. Once you get up above 200, 250, uh, the, the density kind of plateaus. Uh, when it comes to pressure, pressure is a little more um, challenging to study. There are certain processes that only want high pressure certain processes that prefer to run at low pressure. Um, so it's really process dependent. Um, I will say though, as long as you're ensuring that all of the reaction byproducts are being removed, uh, which is pressure dependent, right? Because we're talking about gas residence time and partial pressures and all, again, all these things that I don't have time to go into. Um, you know, as long as you're ensuring those are removed, then everything will be the same. But again, the caveat here is if it's not, let's say you're at too high a pressure, reaction byproducts aren't getting removed, they're staying on the film, these things can suffer, both density and conformality. Very good. And Matt, speaking of time, we're getting a lot of questions. So we, uh, these are great questions I think we're getting. Uh, uh, and by the way, again, just to remind everybody, could you please put your questions into the, into the Q&A box, not the chat box, uh, but we're, um, yeah, we're getting probably the six or seven more questions. So Matt, I know that uh, you still have some material to present. Should we hold off on these until until you conclude speaking or what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think we should keep moving forward. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions at the end and stay on as long as people need, um, or I can, you know, address them after uh, via email as well. So I say we keep moving forward, Mike. Yeah, let's, let's keep moving forward. And exactly. Uh, so if you know, we will definitely try to get to all the questions, but if we, if we do not, we will, um, uh, we, Matt will, will get back to you and obviously feel free to email Matt with further follow-up questions uh, after the webinar, but it's great to see all the questions. Fantastic. So yeah, um, yeah, let's just continue. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thank okay. You. So let, let's talk about why uh, I'm here specifically, right? Why do I think Forge Nano has a solution to that trade-off that I was talking about? So we feel like we've sort of broken that trade-off uh, using two proprietary things, our reactor design and our, our AOD dosing valves, which we call fast pneumatic valves. So let's talk about those each individually. So our reactor design uh, has been named the synchronously modulated flow and draw, the SMFD. I, I know it's a wonderful name. I, I didn't come up with it. I'm not a marketing person, um, but bear with me. I'll, I'll call it the SMFD for short. Just remember that's uh, what we consider to be the whole reactor. And so just to talk through what our reactor looks like, we have a, a shower head design, a single wafer pedestal uh, that goes to the pump. And then we surround our deposition zone with a nitrogen gas curtain, which you can also uh, call a draw control. And when this draw control is on, in essence, we're mimicking that high pressure regime that I talked about earlier, uh, where we're holding precursors in the deposition zone at a higher pressure. Um, this allows us to do a couple of things. It, it improves our precursor utilization 
Uh, we have processes that utilize uh, over 80% of the chemical. You know, if you remember earlier, you're lucky to get to 25, and uh, maybe 50% if, if you really know what you're doing. Uh, it also allows us to put a very small amount of precursor into the deposition zone. Our TMA water process, uh, the typical uh, exposure time is four to eight milliseconds. For more challenging processes, uh, you know, let's say like yttria or hafnia, maybe it's 20, 25 milliseconds. So less precursor in the chamber, uh, more used more efficiently. And that, you know, uh, really helps in the second uh, sort of state when we turn off that draw control, we now, um, again, that draw control comes off. So we're pumping on the chamber continuously. All that precursor flies out of the reactor uh, and we have very short purge times. Again, there's less precursor to purge. We're continuously pumping on the chamber. Um, so this allows for that low pressure regime where we're pumping efficiently. So just to put a finer point on it, we're able to access both of those pressure regimes within each half cycle of ALD. So this gives us purge times that are you know, less than half a second sometimes. Again, TMA water, we have a, a process of record that's running at about uh, 0.8 milliseconds. Uh, sorry, 0.8 seconds. <laughs> so less than a second for a full ALD cycle. Still conformal, still ALD, still all the beautiful stuff. So when you put those things together, uh, we have a few ALD processes that run at greater than 12 nanometers per minute. Uh, and if you remember earlier, my little uh, graph here, this puts us to the right of that, that magical line, but still with perfect conformality. Okay, so again, this is half the story. Uh, I wanna make sure you all have, uh, have some eyes on the, the valves that we use because they're, they're unique. Um, again, they're proprietary, we make them in house. When, we were, uh, when that SMFD was being developed, we found that uh, all of the commercially available valves um, were sort of too slow to really take advantage uh, and, and move as fast as we wanted. So, so these, uh, this valve here in the middle was, was developed. Uh, and the primary development was to make it actuate faster. So this can actuate some, uh, some millisecond, which is pretty great. Um, the other thing that, that makes it look a little different is we do what's called face sealing. So these two sort of marry face to face instead of having a VCR stub, which just adds more uh, volume to purge. So here on the right is a full stack of these FPVs. Um, we call this our manifold. So this, this really minimizes the, the purge volume. They're made out of stainless steel, so they can be heated up to 200 C, which also helps with purging. We also use these for, for precursor uh, control. So we decouple the electronics, so we can do precursor pressure control up to 200 C. This also allows us to strictly limit the number of moles in, in a reactor. So again, because these valves actuate so quickly, we, we can dose the same amount of, of precursor very quickly, uh, which helps purging and, and with efficiency. So, so here's what we offer at, at Forge Nano. Uh, there's three primary tools. Uh, you know, th this, this line has actually been out in the market um, for about 12 or 15 years, uh, you know, battle tested and true. Uh, so we've, you know, we've been uh, in control of it for almost three years now. Um, and so what we've been tasked with doing is sort of upgrading it to the, to the 21st century. Um, so we have our, our Apollo system, which is production, our Thea system, which is R&D, and then our Helios, uh, which is for large format boards and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I have e each of these tools in, in my lab. Um, you know, I'm getting one of our upgraded Theas, which we've, we've already gone through that redesign process. Um, you know, and this gives you a lot of flexibility in your R&D, has more precursors. You have optional load locks. There's, you know, a bunch of flexibility here um, to then transfer to our single wafer production tool, which we call the Apollo. Um, you know, again, this is an old picture, but we're currently in the process of integrating it with a, a cluster design to, to get it to move faster. And so, you know, we've, I've talked about speed already. Uh, and, and certainly when you talk about production, speed is critical. But I, I want to point out one maybe less understood thing about, about speed. And, and that's, you know, when I'm in the R&D lab, I can run 10 or 15 uh, ALD experiments in a single day get immediate feedback on, on the success uh, of that experiment and then continue on. So with our tool set, especially the Thea, that development cycle is accelerated considerably, right? And then of course, when you, when you need to transfer from a Thea to the Apollo, because they're both single wafer systems and the, the main reactor, that SMFD is the same on both tools, uh, there's very little uh, change that needs to happen. And, and if anything, from my experience, uh, when, you put it to, when you put a process on the Apollo, it just moves faster and more efficiently. And so let's talk about the benefits a little bit. 
uh, you know, I've already told you about how the speed and the efficiency. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention is, you know, we, we can do some slightly different things in, in this tool set that gives us uh, superior film properties. Um, and, and we've seen this in a few different examples. Uh, the two that I'll point out here are silica and hafnia. Uh, and what we see is that the density is higher than, than a normal cross flow tool. And, you know, I'll talk about this a little bit more. So, you know, let's, let's sort of leave that, at, leave that there for now. Okay, so before I, I talk about um, some more advanced applications for ALD and, and, and how those relate to MEMS, I do wanna pause for another question break. So, you know, Mike, I know we had quite a few more questions um, I don't know if there's some that that you want to to focus on here or yeah yeah I mean we we actually have had uh, more questions coming in it's great to see all this interest and in all these questions and again just we'll we'll try to get to as many of them as, as we can and as I was mentioning if we cannot then uh, we'll uh, Matt will reply to your question afterwards um, or or again feel free to reach out to Matt to kind of have a follow up discussion and you know have more questions but yeah let's take maybe two or three right now. Uh, I'm going to go to the ones that we have on the chat, in the chat box, and to remind everybody, please put your questions into, into the Q&A box, but I'll go to the ones on the chat so we can clear those out. Um, just really quick uh, responses. Does ALD produce polycrystal or single crystal? Yeah, so that depends on, on the substrate. So for, for a process that is crystalline by ALD, if you put it on an amorphous substrate, it'll look polycrystalline. If you template it on a crystalline uh, substrate, it has a chance of being single crystalline. It can also be polycrystalline. It depends on, on the process. Um, so yeah, depends. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, let's, let's do one more here. How many coding layers at least can be observed by T, uh, TEM, uh, for example, of a titanium oxide film? Uh, for TEM, well, so I mean, that, that depends on your resolution of TEM and, and how far you've zoomed in. You, you can certainly see the, the single, you know, crystalline lattice for, for titania um, by TEM with ALD. Um, so, you know, I, I guess it sort of depends on your, your, how good your TEM is. But, you know, usually when you're, you're looking at high aspect ratio features um, for a film that's on the order of five to 10 nanometers, usually using TEM and you'll zoom at the bottom and then zoom at the top and somewhere in the middle to check your conformality. So hopefully that answers the question. Great, okay, sounds good. Let's take one, uh, this is from our Q&A box. Uh, this is from Ryan Balili, uh, about draw control. Uh, doesn't the draw control, uh, so this is nitrogen flow, uh, uh, saying this usually done by nitrogen flow, as he, as, as Ryan thinks, uh, affect a layer deposition on the perimeter, does that, limit the area you can deposit on? Yeah, Ryan, that, that's a great question. It's actually something I meant to talk about. So I'm, I'm really, uh, really thankful for the question. Doing the draw control right is extremely challenging. Um, that's something that we've worked on for a very long time. Again, this, you know, this tool has been in production for over a decade. So you're right, normally it does. Uh, but because we've, uh, we know that and we've, we've engineered solutions both from a hardware perspective and a process perspective, uh, we know how to get around that. Um, and, and really, the devil's in the details and the details are proprietary. So, but, but you're right, your instinct is absolutely correct. That is one of the challenges uh, with running our tool um, and, and also just sort of developing that from scratch. Very good. All right, Brian, thank you for the question. Let's just do, take one more. This one's from the chat. Uh, just, uh, it's more like a comment. Uh, so TMA and uh, H2O thermal ALD process has been achieved at greater than a 10 nanometer per minute in a single way for tool production for at least a decade. Uh, Matt, any comments on that? Yeah, again, TMA water is probably the easiest ALD process in the world. Um, and, and that's why when you get to those large batch tools uh, for Perk Solar Cells, it's, it's so, um, so successful. But I would make the argument that as soon as you get away from TMA water, which there's a lot of useful ALD films that aren't TMA water. Um, this is really where the challenges come in, right? So I, I would make the argument that that speed for TMA water, that's the only, only other, only process you'll see for, especially for thermal ALD that'll run like that outside of our tool set. So, you know, again, I, for, for our tools, we, we can run at a sub second cycle time. Um, you know, when we talk about things, usually TMA water is is the one place where we don't look that different, but every other film is is where we we improve. So so that, that that's a very good point. Um, you know, and again, I I think TMA water is probably the exception because it's the most well behaved ALD process. 
Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, Philip, thank you for that comment. And uh, Matt, thanks for your comment, your insightful comment on that. So yeah, we have more questions coming in. Matt, I think there's a few more slides that you wanted to cover, right? So I think yeah, exactly. Yeah, th continue. thanks, Mike. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so okay. let's talk about some advanced applications here. Uh, and again, that this was, you know, br brought this up earlier, I promised to talk about it. Um, this is the, the tailored multi-layers or, or nanolaminates. Uh, this is a, a very unique um, use of ALD, and it really comes from that, uh, the ability to put a digital amount of film that's on the angstrom scale. So with most vapor deposition techniques, you sort of have to choose a bulk film or an alloy. Maybe you can get what I'm calling a bilayer, where essentially you have a multi-layer film where you're, you, know, you have probably at best tens of nanometers. Uh, it's very challenging to do it reproducibly. With ALD, because again, that digital nature, you can control each individual component down to the angstrom scale and get the same amount every time. So this is the example I showed, which is essentially a 50-50 mixture of two materials. Um, this is probably the least common way to use multi-layering or, or nanolaminate film. Much more commonly is to have a, a, well, what I'm showing here on the bottom, having a primary component and a much thinner secondary component. So this, and then you sort of, you know, repeat that um, many times. This is a great way to, to maintain the bulk properties of your film while tuning them uh, very finely. Uh, and there's three examples I'll talk about, uh, gas diffusion, uh, essentially moisture barrier, dielectric properties, and film stress. Okay, so let's start with uh, moisture diffusion. This is an example from a customer where they have, uh, they had an, R, an RF MMIC device that they were scaling um, to, to a much more aggressive pitch. They had an, uh, an existing PECVD moisture barrier that they, they knew was gonna fail. Um, so they asked us to sort of help them find a solution. So, you know, at first, of course, they started with their, their incumbent. They put about 800 nanometers of, of PECVD. They did some accelerated testing, which uh, we call HAST testing. Uh, this is done at 130C and 85% relative humidity. At their first benchmark, as expected, that PECVD film failed. So we gave them a 10 nanometer film of what we call the ALD cap. So the ALD cap is a nanolaminate of alumina and silica or alumina and titania. In this case, we gave them silica. At just 10 nanometers at their first benchmark, the ALD film passed. So I, I like to, when I talk about this data, I like to pause here because it, it's a really cool example of uh, how much thinner you can go with ALD versus, versus CBD. Uh, you know, this is 80 times thinner of a film and it passed where CBD failed. Now, I think part of this is from the poor conformality of the PECVD film, uh, but it's, it's still a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool example. So th this specific device needed a much more robust solution. Um, so, you know, we, we gave them a thicker film, a few thicker films, uh, and, and the their 20 nanometers passed uh, pretty much all their benchmark. But this was a very conservative customer. So their final solution was actually a 50 nanometer film uh, of alumina and silica. Again, this is only a seven um, minute deposition. Okay, so, you know, again, this is in the context of, of multi-layers or nanolaminate films. Uh, you know, I have oxygen and water vapor transport numbers here at the bottom. I want, I want to point your attention to the difference between the nanolaminate and just a single layer of alumina. It's, uh, the water vapor transport rate is almost two orders of magnitude better for the, the nanolaminate than it is for, uh, for just a single layer of alumina. Uh, you know, and again, I, I really want to point out that for MEMS devices, uh, moisture barriers are, are quite critical for quite a few things. Um, I'll talk about moisture barriers in a, a different context a little bit later, but, but this is a great gateway for, uh, for MEMS. So, you know, we have a very unique silica film at, at, at uh, Forge, uh, and we do a slightly different process than everybody else. Uh, we call it our CRISP process. And essentially what we do is add a small amount of non-metal precursor to the conversion um, to help catalyze the surface reaction. So, this allows us to do ALD uh, of silica at, at lower temperatures, give you a much higher um, quality of film uh, and allows you to move faster. And so I, I wanted to compare our silica crisp process to what people normally use for silica and that's plasma enhanced ALD. You know, I, I want, I think there's a, another misconception in, in the, the field where people think they have to have plasma ALD for um, high quality film, high density or to remove impurities. So let's, let's look at this uh, table here, kind of focus on the boxes. Um, we're looking at 100 nanometers of film. We're about three and a half times faster. Silicon 
uh, precursor consumption is about 66 times less, uh, and our density is about 6% higher. We have an ideal stoichiometry uh, and, and no impurities, and this really shows out as a higher breakdown voltage. So, you know, again, this is a deposition at the same temperature, um, you know, a very high quality thermal AOD film. So, yeah, again, plasma is not required to have high quality thermal ALD. So moving on to the next example of, of dielectric barriers, uh, I wanted to talk about hafnia. It's certainly the most well-known uh, AOD dielectric out there. Again, this is what uh, Intel used in their, their logic uh, as their logic gate, uh, you know, all the way back you know, 12, 15 years ago. So, you know, if we, we want to use hafnia as a dielectric, but let's say your application some of the properties of hafnia aren't quite good enough, uh, say dielectric breakdown or leakage current. With nanolaminates, you can now add a secondary component to slightly tune the properties while maintaining a good dielectric constant to you know, improve breakdown voltage or decrease leakage current. Uh, and you know, of course, again, here there's the devil's in the details, uh, you know, what percentage of that secondary film, how often you put it in, uh, and, and other things can really um, impact how, how these other properties, including dielectric constant, actually come out. Uh, so this is just using one material. There's a lot of other AOD oxides that are, are useful in dielectric tuning. Uh, I put a, a couple of examples here. And, you know, it gets even crazier if you think about using three different materials, right? So this is a very active area of research, both in, in um, you know, industry as, as well as in, in universities. Um, so, you know, I know MEMS devices, there's a lot of applications for dielectrics, uh, but sometimes your straight up hafnia film isn't quite good enough. So, you know, I would encourage you all to think about other ways to, uh, to improve these. And again, you know, here at, at Forge, we have a, a unique hafnia film. This also uses uh, that crisp conversion. Again, a small amount of non-metal catalyst. Uh, and here I wanted to compare uh, this crisp fil film to batch tools because another one of the misconceptions that we get a lot of is well for thermal ALD, you need a batch tool. Uh, unless, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a, a bleeding edge 300 millimeter tool. So, so here I wanna show an example where that just simply isn't the case. So the first thing I wanna talk about, and it's kind of a callback to earlier, is just how much longer it would take to, for a single process. Uh, now our single process is 20 nanometers. Um, and so to, to process a batch of wafers, which again, for us is a single wafer, in this tool it's 25, it's 43 times shorter in our tool than in the batch tool. So if you have a piezoelectric material, it'll spend 43 times less time at temperature in an ALDX tool. And you say, okay, well, what, what's your actual throughput? Well, even when you account for the number of wafers, the throughput is still at least 70% higher, right? So we can process more than three wafers an hour in that batch tool for this, you're less than two. When it comes to consumption, Again, per wafer, we're still about 29 times less. So, you know, again, uh, I, I haven't talked about the, the quality of the hafnia film, but from a, you know, if you compare hafnia and a throughput, uh, sorry, a cross flow reactor to our ALDX tool, we're, uh, you know, in this case, about 30% uh, percent better. So, you know, again, I wanna maybe encourage people to talk more with us about how you don't need a batch tool for thermal ALD. All right, so let's move into the last section. Uh, I promise I'll talk about stress in a minute, but, but again, that, that just went over a lot of sort of deep content, Mike, so I, I wanted to give us a chance to address any questions, any burning questions we have here. Yeah, Matt, so just in terms of time, just as a quick time check, we have um, like six minutes left before the top of the hour. I really wanted, we can, so for those that want to stay on for um, Q&A after the top of the hour, but just to respect everybody's time, I really wanted you to finish the slides Okay. Before we get to the top of the hour, and like I said, um, we'll, we'll we can stay on for those that want to stay on for Q and A afterwards. That's fine. But I, Matt, if you could finish basically the next five minutes, uh, the, the the slides, um, and then we'll do Q and A. No Thank problem. You. All right. Sure. Great. Okay. So let's move into film stress. Uh, you know, stress is I, I think you all know is critical for for MEMS application uh, applications. And and one of the problems that uh, again another misconception people have is that AOD is a high stress. Uh, deposition technique because all they think about is TMA water for alumina, and it is uh, at that for that process, especially at low temperatures. You know, you get some extremely high film stress. Now that that stress does decrease as you increase in temperature, but if your your device flow is limited to low temperature, you'll think ah, AOD is is too too high of stress. So 
if we look at, at the, the table here on the right, uh, or the graph on the right here, uh, I'm showing that, you know, first of all, not all AOV films are high stress. Uh, you can also get opposite stress, as uh, I'm showing here with Hafnia, or you can get near neutral stress. Our, our silica film is essentially neutral. And again, with nanolaminates or multilayers, you can tune the stress, right? Maybe you want, um, you know, a neutral stress, but you can't use silica. So let's use a 50-50 mixture of alumina and hafnia. There you get a slightly uh, tensile uh, film that's, you know, almost neutral. Let's say, okay, but my, my application actually wants just a little bit of stress. Well, now let's do a 50-50 mixture of alumina and silica. So now you have roughly 100 megapascals uh, of stress. So this is an area where, you know, MEMS and AOD actually fit quite well together. But I think, you know, because of the lack of, of awareness of, of what AOD can offer, especially when it comes to, to nanolaminates, uh, it hasn't really been utilized. So, you know, this is an area where we're, we're really looking to collaborate with, with device manufacturers to actually see how, how this type of uh, strategy works uh, on devices. All right, so, you know, this is a topic we've already talked about a few times, but let's talk about it one more time for, for good measure. And that's moisture barrier performance uh, of AOD. Again, this is a, we, we get asked this question a lot. I think this is the most common um, gateway for, for people to start using ALD. You know, um, it, it's a wonderful, an ALD ceramic, especially as a nanolaminate, is, is a wonderful moisture barrier. It's very successful. The total film thickness is, is quite thin. Uh, here I'm showing an, an image of uh, an ALD layer protecting a, a MEM sensor that has a, a, a polymer a vacuum cavity. So ALD is compatible with polymers as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of useful things that, that come out of this. Uh, on the left here, I wanted to, to show you all a comparison of how AOD matches against, against other techniques. Uh, you know, polymers and, and PECVD, or sorry, PVD and CVD, uh, single and multi-layer films. Uh, you know, even just a single layer AOD film usually outperforms or is equal to a multi-layer CVD film. And that nanolaminate or multi-layer AOD film uh, tends to, to be better pretty much across the board. You know, it's my belief that there's a lot of MEMS applications that need to live in this, you know, sub 10 to the negative six, at least sub 10 to the negative five range. And really the best way to get there is with, is with ALD. And also that, that comfor the, the conformality that, that is afforded with ALD allows you to really, you know, coat whatever you want. Uh, one of the aspects here that is very little talked about is how stress, which I just talked about, and moisture barrier performance interact. It's well known that as you, uh, as a film, uh, absorbs water, the stress can change. Not just ALD films, but, but pretty much every thin film. So, you know, how the stress and moisture barrier properties interact is not something that is, is well understood. And, and it's another topic that we're looking to sort of collaborate with on, on, uh, in the industry. All right, Mike, this is my last slide. Uh, I do want to just briefly give it a, a review of what I've talked about. You know, I, I really think ALD is a, a very elegant technique. You know, you have the ability to, uh, to apply very thin, conformal, high quality films uh, over any area that is accessible by the process gas. Uh, you know, but it, it's, it hasn't been widely adopted because, you know, except for TMA water, that trade-off is really uh, a killer. But the ALDX tool, tool set breaks that trade-off for a wide range of ALD films. Uh, you know, two of the ones I talked about were, were silica and hafnia, where we, we get high quality thermal films uh, at production speeds. Uh, and again, you know, I, I spent the last 20 minutes talking about how great nanolaminate films are and maybe some potential applications for, for MEMS, you know, and, and just how they can improve uh, the, the device properties, uh, you know, by applying a film quickly, uh, efficiently and effectively. All right. So, so here's my email address. Again, you know, happy to happy to engage in questions outside of this. I know we only have a couple minutes more here, Mike, but I'm, I'm happy to continue answering questions and stay on for, for a bit longer. Very good, very good. Matt, uh, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Uh, and uh, it's it's been so great to see, uh, see all, this, uh, all, all these questions from the audience. Uh, we really appreciate it. And it's great to see all, all these great comments and questions. So yeah, we are at the top of the hour. So obviously if you have to go to your next meeting, as Matt mentioned, if you have questions and you want to follow up, here's his email address. You can just uh, grab it, Matt, uh, M. Weimer at forgenano.com. You can see here on this slide and, and then Matt will be happy to get back to you. For those of you that can stay on, Matt, thank you for the generous offer to stay on and answer additional questions. We will stay on for the next maybe 10, 15 minutes or so to answer additional questions. But like we said, if you need to go, 
Um, then we are at the conclusion of the presentation. And then you, you're uh, also welcome to email Matt with your uh, questions afterwards. So let's get to um, uh, let's get to a few questions and uh, see how far we can get. All right. Uh, I will start at the top here to be fair to everybody. So this next question is from uh, Jackson Chang. Um, uh, can the ALD aluminum oxide film be used in CMOS furnaces? Normally metal strictly a metal is strictly prohibited, but aluminum oxide is typically very stable and not treated as uh, as a metal. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in, I, I know that there are um, TMA water for alumina processes that exist in, in CMOS flow in the 300 millimeter space. So it's my understanding that it is compatible. Um, I, I, I'm not the expert on it, but, but as my understanding, uh, it is compatible. Okay, great. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, next one is from Samuel Aldano Delgado. Does ALD produce polycrystalline or a single crystal? I think you may have addressed that one. Yeah, already. I think we addressed that in the chat. Exactly. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, what is the what is the temperature window for ALD? Yeah, that 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 the answer to that question uh, is process dependent. So what that means is it will depend on the precursors you choose. Uh, I'll give you some general rule of thumbs of, of where ALD can exist. There are ALD processes that will go down to room temperature. Um, I've even seen some people play around with sub room temperature ALD, but let's let's not go there. Uh, traditionally, ALD will, you know, depending on the precursor, 300, 350, maybe 400. When you get into ALD with halides, so like aluminum, aluminum trichloride or uh, similar halides like that, you can even go up to 500 uh, C, but you know, um, for, for TMA water, uh, I'm a firm believer that TMA will start to decompose right around 300, 315 degrees Celsius. Um, so for TMA water, I, I consider the, the thermal window to be room temperature to, to 315. Very good. All right. Uh, next one is another question from uh, Jackson Chang. You mentioned subtractive uh, manufacturing with ALD. Is additive manufacturing possible with ALD? Are there any known mass that can be used in situ during ALD deposition? Yeah, that, that's a great question. There's a whole field of ALD uh, called area selective ALD that that is the you know sort of trying to understand that very topic, uh, Jackson. So you know, there's actually a whole conference that's I think it's going to be in Montreal called the Area Selective Deposition Conference. So if, uh, if you are interested, I would suggest, uh, you know, doing a quick Google search for Area Selective uh, Deposition or um, uh, going to the conference. So, you know, you can certainly do this in a few ways. One is with what are called self-assembled model layers, where you block one, one surface uh, and then only grow on a separate surface. Um, there, there's also other strategies where you can put um, some, uh, some polymers that, that will inhibit ALD uh, nucleation. And then you can deposit on, on, you know, pattern that and deposit in one place and not on the other. So th there's a lot of strategies that, that people employ. Um, so yeah, certainly possible, but there's, you know, a, a lot of active research because it's not a, there's no one answer. All right, very good. Next question is from Henking Chi. How about the application for optical anti-reflection coatings, for example, transparency, haze, also maintenance for thick ALD coating, chamber and um, pump cleaning? Yeah, those are great questions. I, I would say that I would, if I was a, a betting man, which I am, uh, I would say that ALD will be propagated into the optics uh, industry in short order, if, if it hasn't already been. Um, as an anti-reflective coating, ALD is extremely uh, successful because you have such great control over those individual uh, thickness layers. Uh, you will get the same RI each time you deposit a layer, which is extremely critical for anti-reflection. Uh, you know, films are are transparent um, for this for this purpose. There's, there you know, you can certainly de deposit films that don't have any haze, so that 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 isn't a concern. Uh, I I know we've done some optical anti-reflection coatings, um, and again, it, it all 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 comes down to how much of each film you're putting in. Uh, you know, you can do uh, just for an example, you can use something with a low reflect uh, refractive index like silica, and something with a very high refractive index like titania. And put those two together. It's a it's a very common common trope, uh, and you know you can make that pretty thick. When it comes to you know a, a chambers, one of the good things about the ALDX tools is because we put so little precursor and hold it away from the walls, we don't have to clean as much. Uh, but traditionally, that that is a, a problem keeping the chamber clean, uh, mostly for flaking is is a big challenge. Uh, as far as pump goes, 
um, you want to put an inline filter to make sure you don't chew through your pump quickly. All right, very good. Uh, uh, the next question is from Zach Sobel. Uh, how does conformality in HR change as you move uh, toward uh, sub-second cycles? Yeah, it's a great question. The, the, the answer is it doesn't. Um, you, you know, the, the one thing I would say though is uh, high aspect ratio can mean a lot of different things. So I'll, I'll qualify that statement by saying when we look at 10 to one uh, and even up to, I would say 50 to one, uh, it doesn't change. It, it, the, the, the transport of gases into a vacuum chamber, into those features uh, on, are on a time scale that is much faster than, than our, our cycle times. So, you know, of course, once you get to features that look like, you know, maybe more tortuous paths or maybe thousand to one, maybe even hundred to one, then things will change. But I, I would make the argument that because we can reduce the pressure in the chamber so quickly, we have an added benefit of coating high aspect ratio features because the best way to coat those is with what's called a, a pump exposure, pump exposure sequence, where you're actually reducing the pressure and not simply exposing those features to, to precursor. So, um, you know, I would say that everybody struggles with that, um, but we struggle with it less. Okay, very good, Zach. Thank you for the question. Next question is from Mary Seto. Uh, for, for molybdenum ALD, how much adjustment of the deposition parameters can be done to try to target a molybdenum film with a specific, uh, with specific properties? So uh, certain sheet resistance, for instance, or is the resulting ALD film more or less what you get? Yeah, so that, that's a, Mary, that's a great question. Uh, it really gets into the details of, of how ALD works. Um, so I would say for a given precursor set, uh, so let's say you have your Molly precursor and your conversion precursor, hydrogen gas or whatever, um, you will get what you get at a certain temperature. Again, as, as we as I mentioned earlier, as you go up in temperature, uh, your film properties will change. Um, so that, that is one way to, to change it. Uh, but I would say more importantly, because ALD is a surface chemistry technique, if you change your precursors, you will fundamentally change your film properties at a given temperature. And, th and that's part of why what we do with our crisp conversion, what makes that special? Uh, because you know, you're allowing the ALD process to occur at a, a different reaction pathway. So, so really this question comes down to what reaction pathway uh, do you want to, to access? And you can, you can access that by using a different precursor or, or with crisp. All right, very good. Next question is, uh, what is the ozone half-life at 573.15K and 63? Yeah. What is the ozone half-life at, at two, okay, so that's 300C, huh? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, um, okay. but we use, we use ozone processes at 300C with great success. So I, I would say that um, it's, it's not so short that we can't use it. Um, so ho hopefully, uh, you know, again, I, I, I gosh, that I, I haven't thought about that since my, my PhD defense. Um, but you know, I'm sure the answer is in the literature somewhere. Yeah. It's a pretty specific question. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll have one Um, okay. One more question from Ryan Belilly. Uh, can you do spatial ALD on top of your SMFD process? That Ryan, that's a, that's a very intriguing question. We have thought about, um, reactor schematics where we're integrating the two, uh, two techniques. Uh, there's nothing that fundamentally limits uh, our ability to do that. So um, th there are some trade-offs that, that you have to sort of work out, but uh, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think it is possible. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, next question, what is the actuation principle of the FPVs? Yeah, the fast pneumatic valves. Yeah, yeah. so the, the actuation principle, well, um, I mean, you have a, a gland that sits on a, on a surface that, that holds precursor on one side, you actuate it uh, to, to let the, the gas through and then you uh, unactuate it to, to close it. How, how, that, how we do that when it comes to the electrical components and everything else, that's proprietary. So uh, I can't actually tell you, but I can tell you that it's different than everything else we've seen. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, next one is uh, from um, Sylvester Sahar Yarraja. Uh, we experienced non-uniformity non of thickness along the uh, sample chamber in a batch type reactor. We are not sure why it happens. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah. Okay. So if, if I understand the question, um, essentially what you're asking is there's a non-uniformity. Um, if you're saying along the chamber, to me that, that suggests the outside of the wafer, um, which is, you know, in a batch reactor, that's where that happens. Um, so now non-uniformity here can mean two things. If the film thickness is lower there, um, that could uh, indicate a thermal gradient. Um, that, that's certainly possible. If the, the thickness is higher on the edge, that can suggest insufficient purges or a thermal gradient. So I, I would look into the, you know, thermal things and, and also ensure that you're purging long enough. Um, if you're not purging, then you could be doing CVD and, and getting some, some very bad, dangerous CVD. All right. Uh, let's, let's take, we have, we have more questions, so let's take a few more. Um, this next one is from Todd, uh, uh, Playstead. Uh, what, is it possible to induce a quote unquote nanowire or quote unquote whisker structure growth in ALD? Yeah, there, there is a few examples where, especially for crystalline ALD films, uh, you'll get a preferential growth phase. Um, a great example is um, 2D transition metal dichalcogenides, uh, tungsten selenide, um, and uh, sorry, moly sulfide and tungsten diselenide. So with those, you, you tend to get sort of like spiky growth. Um, there's also a field called sequential infiltration synthesis or SIS where you can induce whisker formation in a polymer. Uh, you can have like a zinc oxide whisker with a, a, an alumina cap. Uh, but I would, I would sort of qualify all that by saying in most ALD processes, you're gonna get deposition everywhere. So nanowire or whisker formation is much less common. And it's one of those like, hey, this lives on the fringe of what ALD does. Okay. All right. Uh, next question is from uh, Alex Shi from uh, Micronix. Uh, so we are uh, a 3D NAND uh, maker and the film is deposited inside a small diameter hole with very high aspect ratio, for example, 100 nanometer diameter with a height of three microns or more, more than three microns. Is the single wafer so short? Uh, does a single wafer have such a short purge time it can fully remove uh, the whole bottom residue by byproduct? Right, so I, I assume for that that whole fill, you're going to need something like tungsten. Um, usually, when when again, my understanding with 3D NAND for the the word line fill, it's a, it's a what's called a fluorine free tungsten ALD process. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this is what ALD is used for. If you know, with with the purge times, um, it's certainly possible. Again, the the purge times are directly related to how much precursor you put in, so that will be uh, something you'd have to we'd have to look at. Uh, it's I, again that that's pretty far outside of what we do on a day to day, so I I can't say with any sort of certainty one way or the other. Okay, all right, uh, and one more thank you thank you Alex for that question and another question from Ryan Belilly. What's the largest area you can code with your largest equipment available? Yeah, so the you know our, our tools right now, and I'm actually really glad that um, this was brought up. Right now, our, our, our production tool and the R&D tool are, are 200 millimeter and below. Um, so we have that as sort of our standard offering. Uh, we also have the Helios, which is that large format tool that I, I, I showed earlier. That was the one on the, on the far right. Uh, the diameter there is about 525 millimeters. Um, that, that's the largest we have available right now. But, but again, you know, that, that is the same sort of reactor design just scaled in a very interesting way. We don't really know the limit of how large that can be scaled to, uh, but it's certainly more than 500 uh, millimeters. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, Matt, so just a quick check here. We have still about a dozen questions um, and we're, you know, basically 13 minutes past the hour. Um, how are you, you know, should we you know, is it okay to take a few more? Should we pause? Uh, should we stop here? And, and, uh, and then uh, you can follow up with the remaining questions afterwards via email. And again, everybody's welcome to reach out to Matt as well uh, with more questions and the questions that you have. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I think I have time for a couple more questions and then, and then maybe we'll cap it. How does that sound, Mike? That sounds perfect. Yep, that sounds great. So we'll, let's take, we'll go in order to keep it fair uh, and let's take the next uh, two questions. So um, we just addressed Ryan's question about the largest equipment available, right? Yep. yep. Okay, great. All right, so next one is from uh, 
Mark uh, Schnipper from Seuss Micro Optics. What is the deposition homogeneity over 200 millimeter wafers? Yeah, you know, for the, the processes we have, you know, uh, I'll talk about uh, the ones that I showed. Uh, for, for TMA water, I mean, you can get below 1% thickness uniformity. Uh, for silica, 1% is also achievable. Uh, for hafnia, that, that's a bit more of a development process. So I think the best we've gotten is, is somewhere down around 4%. Uh, for the 200 milliliter wafer. But that, that's, again, something we expect to just be a matter of process tuning. Uh, th there's nothing that's fundamentally limiting, um, you know, that sub 2% thickness uniformity. Very good, Mark. Appreciate the question. Let's, this is a, let's take one more. This will be the final one. This is from Shang Lu. Um, and the question is, ALDX, is it a spatial uh, ALD process or not? No, it is not. Um, you know, if uh, spatial means you're actually moving something around. In our chamber, everything is static. Uh, we're just using that draw control to, to dictate what pressure regime we want to live in, right? So we, we have that high pressure regime to use precursor efficiently and that low pressure regime where we're purging efficiently. And we're, most of that control is done by that draw control. Uh, and again, we're accessing each of those uh, pressure regimes within each half cycle, but nothing is moving. Uh, so it's not spatial ALD. All right, very good. Uh, well, thank you so much for all the questions. We, we actually, this is more questions than we expected, which is a great, great sign that uh, certainly this is a hot topic. And obviously, uh, Matt is an excellent speaker that uh, is a tr truly an expert, one of the top experts worldwide on this topic. So it's really great to see all the questions. We thank very much uh, everybody for attending uh, this webinar session. Uh, we will um, be distributing the uh, slides and also the presentation recording afterwards. So give us, you know, maybe a day or two to uh, get that to you. If you don't uh, see it from us, just let us know. Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Matt kindly shared his email address here. You can see it on the slide. So you're definitely welcome to reach out to Matt with further questions, discussions, um, and other, you know, if you have any other uh, follow-up that you'd like to do. Um, uh, with that, I think we're, uh, it's been a very, very successful uh, webinar uh, session. Matt, thank you so much for delivering an excellent talk and uh, providing so many great insights. We really appreciate it. Uh, so again, we'll conclude here and we look forward to uh, staying in touch uh, with everybody. Uh, again, please reach out to us as well if you have any questions uh, to Microtech Ventures uh, too. Matt, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And thank you all for, for joining and, and being so active and participating. It was quite, quite a joy. Thank you, everyone. Likewise. Thank you so much and happy holidays and best wishes in the new year to everybody. Uh, thank you very much.